during the past few years, my group has focused on the area of concentrator photovoltaics, a fancy term for converting sunlight into electricity in a new, ultra-efficient, and hopefully affordable fashion that opens new vistas in, uh, within the realm of solar power conversion. The idea is to replace the expensive solar cells with affordable, clever, high-efficiency optics, which can be mass-produced accurately without any high technology facilities, unlike the solar cells, so that if we concentrate, let's say, a thousand times, only one one thousandth of the system is the expensive solar cell, it shifts the burden onto the development of clever optics. Nevertheless, the cell is at the heart of this power conversion system. One of the systems we've developed is a rather novel optical system for concentrating sunlight to immense levels and then probing the complex solar cells that comprise the latest generation of ultra-efficient converters of sunlight into electricity. This is just a schematic diagram to illustrate how the multi-junction or multi-layered cells that are now commercial can convert sunlight into electricity in a much more efficient fashion by exploiting more of the solar spectrum than any one layer can. This is a complex, expensive technology. The cells are quite expensive compared to the conventional solar cells with which you are familiar, like silicon. And that's why concentration is so critical. We have to reduce the fraction of the system comprised by this. This is just a, a photograph of the kind of system we've developed. We concentrate sunlight to enormous levels. This is a schematic of it. Couple it into an optical fiber, an optical channel to bring it inside a laboratory where we can work on the controlled conditions. Here, we're interrogating cells. We're forcing them to reveal subtle physics under unusual, unusual conditions of very high intensity and very localized irradiation. This provides the kind of information manufacturers need. It informs them how can they improve the efficiency of the cells, how can they plan the next generations of cells. Here in a very, this is a one centimeter cell, here in a much smaller two millimeter cell. Incidentally, these are commercial. These are not laboratory curiosities. Cells you can pick up a telephone and order. And they can be exposed to 1,000 times the solar intense, ambient solar intensity. Here you just see circles we've drawn with different size fibers that we use to probe these cells. The major contributions I would like to hope we've made fall in two areas. One is in elucidating the subtle physics of complex ultra-efficient cells that enable us to now design future generations of more efficient and more affordable cells for solar power conversion. One. Two is inventing fundamentally new classes of optics, like here, for these cells that can generate um, electricity at unprecedented efficiency and at prices that are far lower than conventional silicon-based photovoltaics, and they have been translated into the multi-megawatt systems now being installed. It goes from a, a desktop drawing, a fundamentally new idea in your head, and here it is in the field. So we have had the pleasure of seeing these stewarded into, uh, into the field, and you see here from the, from the tabletop 31 centimeter device to the module that's about one and a half by one meters, to a nine kilowatt array, which now comprises the unit that produces massive electricity. Uh, in terms of uh, miniaturization, again, the cells that can utilize the full solar spectrum, the trend over the last decade has been to um, transition from centimeter level technology to millimeter level technology. The motivation is multifold. These can be more efficient. They can be made with more precise microfabrication techniques that are now available thanks to the semiconductor industry. And their efficiency peaks at a higher concentration, a subtle point because it means that we can transfer more of the burden to the optics and make the system more affordable. They have a drawback. This is one one hundredth the area of that. This is a hundred square millimeters. This is just one. So the number of wires and contacts and uh, peripherals increase also by a factor of 100. Fortunately, this is not a major uh, factor, a major detraction, but it is something that has to be considered in the optimization. You see these metal grids, typically made of gold or, or other metals that can extract the electricity effectively from the bulk material to the, 
to the exterior. You can already see how manufacturers of 30 square millimeter cells or even one square millimeter cells are investing considerable efforts in determining non-uniform optimized uh, fingers of these metal structures to more effectively extract the electrical current. The results of our research have informed this and in fact we've even developed micro optics. Uh, optics at the level of 100 microns, micrometers and less, which can completely obviate the shading. It's a parasitic loss. All the light that strikes those grids are reflected out and you're paying dearly for those photons, for that light. We can now design optics which can redirect even concentrated light and put it right where it belongs rather than where it would have gone otherwise. Just as an aside, let me mention we've also demonstrated the fact that these cells can be cooled in a totally passive fashion. It's proven you don't need for circulation hydraulic systems with all the parasitic requirements, with all the complications, and it's a fail-safe mechanism. The cell resides on a simple aluminum plate, which in any event provides the casing, the enclosure for these modules. This is a sol focus array that generates 7 kilowatts. It's it comprises a large part of their current installations in Europe. This is the one centimeter technology. So yes, first we perform the laboratory experiments, do the thermal physics, prove it with experiments. Now it, with confidence we can move to megawatt systems and indeed these are being monitored and they are performing only 20 degrees centigrade above the environment which poses no problem. It's even better for the millimeter technology but this is not quite ready for prime time. This is still in the R&D stage. Another area in which we've made contributions is understanding how can you design high-performance optics tailored to these particular types of cells. The ordinary Fresnel lenses you'll read about on the internet and you can buy off the shelf suffice for intermediate to um, mediocre performance. But if you want to obtain the most out of these, and because cost is a relevant factor in addition to the physics, you must have maximum performance optics. These are two generations of optics we developed for the Soul Focus Corporation of California. Uh, this one for the one centimeter technology. This comprises the workhorse of their technology today, and I'll show you some examples of multi-megawatt systems now being installed. In addition, what's on the agenda, what's in uh, prototype development, research and development, is for the millimeter technology cell and for a new kind of micro-optics made of all glass. Areas of solar research in photovoltaic power conversion of major potential impact where will the breakthroughs come during the coming decade or two? I'd like to divide it into three basic categories. Materials, optics, and nanofabrication. In terms of materials, this is a state-of-the-art uh, schematic of a state-of-the-art solar cell which uses three different materials. Uh, this is just the graph of how the intensity of the sunlight we receive on Earth depends on the wavelength of that light. And it's just illustrating how each of these materials is tailored to a part of the spectrum. This is state of the art today. However, by using more junctions that are better suited to the solar spectrum, the potential for improving conversion efficiency is prodigious, meaning as much as 50% relative. This is uh, enormous in technological terms. So one direction is what are the materials? How do we identify them? How can we fabricate them? And how can we assemble cells like that? How can we take better advantage of the spectrum that nature is granting us? The, the third one, which I don't have a slide for, is in nanofabrication and microfabrication. If these new semiconductor processes, if these uh, semiconductor layers, if the optics are going to be miniaturized to the millimeter and submillimeter level, then micro and nanofabrication techniques that are accurate, affordable, and reproducible on an immense scale must be developed. There has been enormous progress. We're at it. The, the technology is really in its infancy. And the amalgamation, the fusion of these three of materials, optics, and nanofabrication, I think are going to give rise to a new generation of a complete package of optics, photovoltaics, based on new material science. This is what I find exciting. Second one is in optics. This is just one example 
of a fundamentally new class of optics, in this case we developed, this has uh, been adopted by Soul Focus, where many questions are asked in terms of can it be maximum performance in terms of how much light is delivered at a very high intensity, can it be delivered efficiently, can the system be ultra compact rather than deep, that's a major factor in the price of the system, can it be made from uh, uh, existing manufacturing processes and existing materials. So this is, let's say, where we stand today. The potential for improving this is also not small in terms of relaxing optical tolerances, meaning the systems can be made much less expensively. Uh, can, the, can the throughput, the optical throughput, the amount of energy that's lost because of unwanted reflections or absorption, new coatings, that's also part of the, uh, the challenge in optics. Uh, this is another example of the one centimeter cell optics that we've developed for cell focus, which is all glass optics. All glass optics for centimeter technology is ludicrous because it weighs a ton. The moment you reduce it by an, literally a factor of 10, it becomes comparable to a pane of glass. Now we can talk about microfabrication techniques with clever optics, and this is just where we stand today. There is improvement, and we know that from fundamental laws of optics. So yes, there is a considerable room in optics and optical materials. There are four particularly promising and exciting areas for the future. One is improved materials for improving conversion efficiency by as much as a factor of two. The second is luminescent concentrators, meaning optical devices that can take solar light and change the spectrum and concentrate it in a rather novel way that I'll illustrate in a moment. Third is the antenna method. I've been speaking of solar cells, but your cell phone and your radio and your television convert electromagnetic radiation, which is just light at a different wavelength, into electricity quite effectively with the simple antenna effect that we're all taught about in high school or first year university physics. Why not do that with sunlight? Now, no one knows how to do that yet, but I'll describe in a moment why this, this poses a tantalizing prospect and wonderful challenge. The fourth area is biological area. Can one convert sunlight via photosynthesis in a method which is prodigiously superior to the efficiencies that nature generates in natural ponds uh, or uh, outdoor conditions today? And I believe the answer is yes, and there's a good basis for it. So I'll take them one at a time. First, the semiconductor materials for solar cells. So the first area of materials for the solar cells is, and th this is the transition from the earlier discussion we had, can we find materials that are better suited to the solar spectrum, interface to each other in a more efficient way, and therefore can boost the efficiency in a, in a significant fashion. At least a factor of 1.5 I think is realistic in the coming decade, and the factor of 2 may be unrealistic, but it's theoretically possible, even more than a factor of 2. So that's uh, in terms of the materials. The luminescent concentrator, the antennas, and the biological mechanism are more futuristic. There is some research, but they're, at a, they're in their infancy and the performance is highly unsatisfying. But you asked a very good question about fundamental limits. The fundamental limits tell you it's possible. No law of physics precludes it. Therefore, it poses a, uh, a wonderfully appealing challenge to physicists. The concept of a luminescent concentrator is to have a totally stationary device which can take sunlight and tailor it in two ways. Tailor the spectrum to the solar cells and increase the concentration. So again, we can benefit from very little solar cell and a great deal of optics. This is just a schematic diagram to illustrate it. This is a system which would not have to track the sun. What I didn't mention before, and perhaps I should have, is all of these concentrator systems must track the sun with accurate uh, systems. They must be pointing at the sun at all times. That is an existing off-the-shelf technology, and it may only comprise about 10% of the system cost, but it still is not negligible. Here, you would have a slab of glass or acrylic or some other nominally transparent material in which there are dye molecules or quantum dots, which are a new kind of technology that manipulate light 
from one color to another, which would absorb the solar spectrum, re-emit it at a different wavelength, better suited to the solar cell performance, and then by total internal reflection, the same thing that happens in, in, a, in a, an optical fiber or to a limited extent in prisms, brings that light after a small amount of leakage back out the entrance to the sides which we would cover it with solar cells. It would be a stationary concentrator of immense potential. And the laws of physics allow it. The problem is, what are the materials that we dope this uh, transparent acrylic or glass with? Uh, no one has answers for that that is satisfactory. The answers to date are extremely inefficient. The appeal is it can be quite low cost, totally stationary, and the concentration can be tailored to any level you want, even greater than the 46,000 I mentioned before in principle, because that's based on geometric limits, and here we have what's called brightness enhancement. We manipulate the spectrum, not the geometry. It's a complementary physics that's fascinating. The third level is the antenna effect. Can we have an analog? Can you take your cell phone and just scale it down so it, it would work for sunlight? Now the answer seems to be, in principle, yes. The laws of physics allow it. No one knows how to do this yet. But the fact that the laws of physics allow it prompts us to start the investigation. This is the latest state of the art for far infrared radiation. This is taking uh, electromagnetic radiation, what we call light, which is uh, lower in wavelength than the microwave that powers your cell phone, and is converting it into electricity. Uh, for those who understand the, the dimensions, the wavelength of this is about 20 micrometers. Remember that your cell phone is dealing with centimeter wavelengths, several centimeters. This is at the level of tens of micrometers, so it's orders of magnitude less. And already there's progress. This is an array of antennas for infrared radiation. It's extremely inefficient, unfortunately, but the very fact that it does convert infrared radiation into electricity and can rectify it, I mean, it can give you a DC electrical output, is a major breakthrough. This has been done at the Stanford University and some private companies in the U.S. I find this a wonderfully encouraging indication that we should be able to apply our knowledge of optics and of materials, and nanofab nanofabrication is absolutely essential here because the antennas will have to be hundreds of nanometers. That synthesis awaits to be solved, but I, I believe it, it comprises a very exciting uh, potential development for future solar technology. And the last one relates to algae. Algae are single-celled organisms that photosynthesize. Unlike plants, they don't have to grow roots, they don't have to grow leaves. Therefore, they can focus more of their resources on photosynthesizing efficiently. Indeed, they are the most efficient photosynthetic organisms known on Earth. Now, you asked about fundamental limits. That was an excellent question. <laughs> and there is a fundamental conversion limit for algae from sunlight plus water plus carbon dioxide into sugar. This is the chemical storage of sunlight. It's a dream because then from sugar you can produce fuel and drive your car around on that or your airplane or in any kind of uh, automotive uh, vehicle. Well, the problem is that algae in nature are order of magnitude below that fundamental limit. So there's a question. Does that mean that no human intervention could come up with clever optics, clever genetic engineering, clever reactor design? After all, we can build reactors and expose the, the algae to light in a particular temporal, that is time-dependent fashion, spatial pattern, intensity, we can manipulate the colors. Well, uh, some of the research we did during the last few years indicates that the answer is yes, it is possible. These limits could be realized. If it were easy, it would have been done, of course. So this prompts uh, the beginning of a research direction in biotechnology, the ultra-efficient conversion of sunlight into biofuel. Not via corn and sugar and palm oil, which is intrinsically limited to levels which are really too low to be sustainable for the world, but algae have that latent capability built in. So that fourth area I find of futuristic research is what I'd call solar biology. 
tweaking photosynthesis to get the most out of organisms that nature doesn't, doesn't execute intrinsically, but we as scientists can. So how can photosynthesis be manipulated? There are ways to do it. One of the more intriguing ways is synchronizing light input to it. You don't just irradiate it in a continuous fashion. These are possibilities, and they hold enormous potential. And I think the solar biology is the key answer to solar fuels. Solar electricity produces electricity. Storing electricity is problematic. It can be done. It's expensive. It's short lifetime. But it doesn't give you fuels. This gives you fuels. Just like uh, sugar and corn biofuels give you fuels, but that's not really a sustainable solution, and that's clearly understood. This, in this direction, the laws of nature tell you it's possible, and it can be sustainable, and will be order of magnitude more efficient. So I say, let's embark in that direction. And the nice thing here is it's almost a zero carbon dioxide balance because the algae needs CO2 to photosynthesize. Then you convert them into biofuel. When you combust it in your engine, you produce CO2, and it's almost neutral, as opposed to biofuels from corn or sugar, where it's far from neutral. There really isn't that much advantage. The, the only advantage there is you gain energy independence. You don't have to import your oil or drill into the ground. You can grow it. But there are all kinds of well, uh, I say, I think well articulated drawbacks to growing. Uh, crops like corn and sugar instead of other foods. In algae, one of the advantages is all it needs is saline water, sunlight, and carbon dioxide, nothing else. It doesn't need fertile land. Deserts are great places to breed algae. So we need optics, we need biotechnology, we need some genetic engineering, we need uh, uh, clever uh, material science. So I say let's, let's embark on it. And we, we have started on it, but this is a long path. The uh, major advantage of the concentrated photovoltaics is it's far more efficient. It's more than a factor of two, more than twice as efficient as the best solar thermal. This is huge in, by any uh, uh, technological criterion. That said, its drawback is storing energy. Electricity can be stored, but it's both highly expensive and short lifetime. Like the laptop you hold in your hand, that battery is expensive and it only endures for about a thousand cycles. This is not the sustainable technology. There will be progress, and perhaps within a reasonable period of time, there will be viable solutions, but it's not available today. So. When one of these systems encounters a cloud covering the sun or a rainy day, it generates zero power. Not low power output, zero power, because concentrated sunlight, and because diffuse sunlight cannot be concentrated. Utilities despise intermittent input. They don't want 100 megawatts, which they're pleased about, and then within a few minutes it drops to zero. That's the drawback of photovoltaics today. As long as it doesn't penetrate the grid in terms of a high percentage, they tolerate it. That's photovoltaics. Its advantages and disadvantages. Solar thermal, the disadvantage is it's less than half the efficiency. Its big advantage is the potential to provide reliable, continuous power. And the reason is twofold. There are two options in solar thermal for, uh, for continuous operation. The simple one, the off-the-shelf one, is you take a line of natural gas and the steam turbine that's being fed by solar has two inputs from the solar field and just burning natural gas. So whatever solar does not provide, let's say, let's say you have a 100 megawatt turbine, if solar provides 80 megawatts, you burn gas to provide the other 20. The turbine sees it as a black box. I just need 100 megawatts uh, of power. I don't care where it comes from. You could burn gas for 100 megawatts of power, too. Um, this is very attractive to utilities. The other option is to store heat. You can oversize a solar system. Part of it drives a turbine. The other part charges a high-temperature thermal storage facility, like molten salt. And then you don't need the gas. If there's a cloud, then the thermal storage facility is drained, or part of it is drained. 
and the heat drives the turbine. So again, the utility sees an uninterrupted source of electricity, and they love that. This is the trade-off. I don't think that any one technology will conquer the field. I call this the multivitamin approach, just like you don't take just vitamin D, you take A and B12. So it will be with solar. Each of these technologies will have a niche. They will all be adopted. They should all be pursued, and they all have a role. Whatever success we may have had with Soul Focus, or Soul Focus has had, first of all, can be recreated anywhere that has a good scientific infrastructure. And India definitely has it. I see it here. I've seen it at IISC. I've seen it at the Nehru Center. It's fabulous. So there's no question about that. Now specifics. Soul Fo our experience with Soul Focus was they're coming to us in Israel and saying they wanted to have a major impact in solar power generation, and they had identified concentrated photovoltaics. So now I'll give you the bullets you asked for, the bulleted uh, evolution of this. The first is you have to understand the wish list. What's the company's wish list? The second item will be, can we invent all the new notions, optics, materials, whatever, that are needed to satisfy that wish list? And the third is, can we build and generate proof of concept for this? Tabletop, lab bench proof of concept. Do the physics work. If all these three work out, then you're in great shape. Then the problem is mainly money and production engineering. The fourth stage then is, can we scale up to large, uh, large pilot plants? And then uh, proof of concept in the field at, at, at a multi-megawatt scale. So, Th those are the four bullets. Now, the first, <laughs> so the first part, uh, Soul Focus came to us. It wasn't Soul Focus then. It was two really charming and bright engineers, Gary Conley and Steve Horn, in a garage in Saratoga, California, who came to us in stable care and explained why they had concluded that the, the direction they had started would probably not succeed. And I said to them, give us a wish list. You've probably never even articulated this for yourself. Think, dimensions, materials, costs, processing, all of these. And we'll tell you what violates the laws of physics and we have to toss out the window, and what does not, and then we're only limited by our imagination. And they were able to do this, and they were able to do it rapidly. Once we understood this list of constraints, we saw that there was nothing in the literature, off the shelf, so to speak, that could satisfy all the constraints, so they had not missed the boat, so to speak. And for us, it was a challenge. Could we invent a fundamentally new class of optics, tailored to the current generation of ultra-efficient solar cells that could satisfy their wish list and thereby translate into affordable, reliable, and reliability is no less important than affordable here. Reliable solar power generation. And uh, this, this shows a bit of the evolution. We invented their first generation, what they call generation one, for the one centimeter squared or 100 millimeter squared solar cell technology. Soul Focus makes everything except the cells. That's quite a complex epitaxial-based technology. There are, at the time, there were only three or four companies in the world that could produce it. Today, it's more like a dozen, and it's growing every year. So they had to import that cell technology, and they wanted to build everything else. We invented a fundamentally new class of optics that satisfied their whole wish list, or the wish list at the time, because you learn lessons as you go along in life. With this, uh, we were able to then build prototypes. Uh, during my sabbatical at the University of California with Roland Winston, uh, we were able to find companies that could produce the basic components. And by the time I left, here is a module of 16 of these miniature optics. Each one is 31 centimeters, one centimeter cell, and it generated 240 watts of power as designed. So this is the tabletop device that works, so to speak. While we were at it, we also were interested in the millimeter scale technology. And Roland and I invented yet another class of new optics based on all glass optics, which they were excited about in terms of the ease of fabrication, no alignments, ease of production. Glass is a very cheap material. It's cheaper than polymers, incidentally, in terms of the raw material. And we succeeded in that, and that's what Steve Horn is holding here. But this is, this is still a prototype. So from that stage of successful benchtop prototype, meaning you start with a wish list, you invent 
some new science, you build it, it works, end of this stage. And now I fast forward to the end. This is a, a photo of the type of multi-megawatt systems that Sol Focus is now installing. This is in Spain, it's about 200 kilometers south of Madrid. They now have factories for different parts of the technology in Arizona, in California, in China, in India as well, in Delhi. Um, and uh, so th this is the technology that they have now converged upon. However, for me, the story doesn't end here. For them, at the moment, they've basically frozen R&D, research and development, and they want to produce as many of these as reliably as possible. Incidentally, the reliability here has been checked, and it's excellent. The system w went online in November 2008. We're now sitting 14 months later. There are no problems. The output of the system is essentially 100% of what was projected. That's rare. In physics, something's always supposed to go wrong. Here, fortunately, it didn't, but that's to the credit of Gary and Steve and how meticulously they demanded that every component be reliable before they would dare install a system. Um, now, in the process of producing these modules and these systems, they revised their wish list. There were certain items they were more concerned about, materials, reliability over 20 or 30 years. No one knows the answer, but there's reason to be concerned. So they asked, could, for example, could we eliminate some of the alignments in the production process? A simple single mold injected element. Could we eliminate an optical bond between a solar cell and a piece of glass so that there would be no danger of these separating and degrading performance? Could we, could we design a system which, if it were off axis, unintentionally, but it always happens in the field. This is always supposed to be pointing directly at the sun, but the tracker stops working and the sun continues moving. Some systems, not so focused, but some systems were destroyed because when the sun focuses off axis, it focuses on a non-cell element and destroys it. So can we design optics which are basically fail safe? So now the wish list is expanded and we go back to our drawing board, so to speak, and we invented some new optics. Indeed, these are papers we've published and patents that have been taken out between my university and cell focus. And it's an ongoing relationship which has been immensely gratifying, but more than that, rewarding scientifically. I can have my graduate students and my colleagues working on this with me. We're developing fundamentally new optics, and it's so rewarding that it translates into a real device that can produce solar power uh, for the planet.